Are you a man looking for an intensive program to help you overcome your sexually addictive behaviors? Gateway to Freedom is your answer. Gateway to Freedom is a three-day intensive workshop for men seeking to overcome sexually addictive behaviors. Whether married, single, or divorced, Gateway to Freedom will help men regain hope for a new life of purity and real contentment. The workshop is conducted by experts in the field of sexual addiction recovery. Your experts have over 35 years of combined experience. Read testimonials of workshop alumni at gatewaymen.com. Get all the info and register online at gatewaymen.com or call 1-800-49-PURITY. Hi, my name is Jonathan, and I'm the founder of the Gateway to Freedom Workshop. I want to personally invite you to be part of our next workshop coming up April 24th through the 26th in Texas. So call us today at 1-800-49-PURITY or visit gatewaymen.com. Welcome to Pure Sex Radio, training men, educating women. Are you ready to get real and start living each day in purity? This dynamic program is designed to educate, encourage, and equip listeners with the tools necessary for living a life of sexual purity. Pure Sex Radio brings you the best in mobile talk radio. Listen to real life struggles, learn how to overcome lust, pornography, and sex addiction, and get serious about purity. Good day, radio listeners. Welcome to this week's edition of the Pure Sex Radio broadcast. We're glad to have you with us. My name is Jonathan. We have a special guest today, Stephen Kuhn. Stephen, how are you doing today? Good. How are you doing? Good. Stephen is with Belt of Truth Ministries, and he's written a book called Ten Lies Men Believe About Porn, and we're going to get into that a little bit uh, later. Before we dive into just kind of hearing Stephen's story and just getting, a, uh, getting to know him and just kind of what he's been doing and in ministry, I wanted to share with you listeners, as we do periodically, that we are a listener-supported broadcast. We're grateful to all of you partners that have come alongside to help us distribute this podcast in over 80 countries around the world. And so if you'd like to learn about the ways that you can partner with us, simply go to puresexradio.com and click on the Donate tab. So, Stephen, I want to jump right in because I would love for you to just be able to introduce yourself to our listeners and just maybe kind of share with them uh, your own story. Uh, we love, uh, we value story here at our ministry. We believe that the, you know, kind of the the power of healing and transformation comes through the avenue of story. And um, so we'd love for you to just introduce yourself and, and tell our listeners kind of who you are and where you've been. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so I live up in Oregon in the Northwest. And, uh, you know, my story, my story with pornography starts the same way that a lot of guys did. And that was just with, with finding a playboy. Um, you know, for me, I grew up in a Christian household and it was never it was never in our home. I Like I knew uh, from an early age that it was it was not something that was welcome in our home. Mm -hmm. um, so I actually ended up, I found mine uh, just out in the woods. I was riding my bike on some BMX trails out in the woods with some friends. I was probably 12 years old and came across an abandoned homeless camp and kind of just sitting out there in all the rubble was, was a playboy. And, uh, you know, I remember like the, the crazy thing for me is like, I, I had noticed girls before then. I mean, because I, I remember being really excited when I found the magazine. But like the crazy thing for me was I was I feel like I was literally hooked. Like I don't mm. I don't really remember there being any sort of ramp up period or anything. It was like from the moment I saw that magazine, I knew like I need more of this. Mm. And, uh, you know, but but then, of course, there was this issue of, you know, I, I couldn't just bring it home because if, if my parents found it, I knew I'd get in trouble. And. And so kind of in that moment, I, I, I figured that's kind of when my life split into two, two separate forks. I had the, the very public version of me, which was the, the church kid, uh, you know, follow all the rules, go to youth group. I was on youth group leadership, all that sort of stuff. 
Uh, but then this private version of me, which was very hidden, looking at porn, uh, constantly seeking it out, shoplifting porn because I wasn't old enough to buy it. Mm. Um, you know, I ended up, uh, like a lot of kids, you know, I, I had a stash in my closet that, that, uh, I was mortified that if my parents ever found out about that, not only would I be in trouble, I'd be really embarrassed, but, um, you know, I just knew I had to hide it. So, so from day one, I was both hooked and hidden. And I think that really fed a lot of my addiction because mm -hmm. I, I learned how to hide really well. I learned how to lie really well. And uh, I could pretend like, you know, I'm, I'm good little Steve. And, but then deep down, I knew I had this secret. And, and over the years, that, that, uh, that secret part of me just kept growing and growing. And when I, uh, the first time I had the internet was when I left for college. And so all of a sudden, I had, uh, you know, I had full time access to the internet. I had a room with a lock on the door, nobody checking in on me. And that's really when my addiction just exploded. Um, I remember by the end of my freshman year, almost almost every single night, I'd be sitting at my desk looking at porn until, you know, two, three, four in the morning. It was just this, this uh, it consumed all my time. And I, I had no, I didn't even realize how much time was going by. Mm -hmm. and, now, uh, let me ask you this. Let me ask you this about when you were a kid, because you, you mentioned it a couple of times about this uh, sort of uh, fear um of of bringing this stuff home or having it in your closet and was that because there was uh an express like like was that said in your home out outright that pornography is not allowed in this home and por or was that more of like you just had this internal feeling of this would not be something that's welcome here because and the reason I asked that is because man I I we talked to so many guys that grew up in Christian homes and few, if any of them had specific conversations with their parents about pornography and sexuality. And that. But there was definitely this perceived idea that this is something that we could never discuss here. So I'm just kind of wondering what was your atmosphere in your home growing up? Was that something that you had just kind of perceived or was it yeah. something that was specific, specifically communicated in your house? Yeah, for me, it was it was just something I kind of perceived, um, you know, gr growing up in youth group, I, I heard it from youth pastors and all that, that, you know, it was an inappropriate thing. And I just kind of put two and two together. And it's like, oh, we're a Christian household. This just isn't something that would be accepted. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the closest I ever had to a conversation like that was probably at some point in middle school. Um, I remember one of my friends ended up getting a bikini girl poster for his room. And I thought that was kind of cool. And I remember having this thought like, well, I know obviously porn is bad, but I wonder if maybe that's okay. And so I, I asked my dad and that's, you know, at that point we had a conversation about how that's not really appropriate. And, and he was, I remember him, you know, being good about telling me why and all that. Um, but, but that was kind of the closest thing I ever had to a discussion about like, you know, pornography is not acceptable in this house. Mm -hmm. Which then, you know, kind of leaves you stuck as a kid because now, you know, you said you were 12 when you were, you know, you first saw porn, which is right around that age when, man, hormones and puberty and all those kind of things are happening. And it sounds to me like then your your sex education, so to speak, was essentially porn. Yeah, uh, porn and then, you know, public school education and uh, other kids uh, you know, telling me the best of their knowledge, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, and so it was, and I, I, I'm finding that's very typical of, of my generation that, uh, you know, it wasn't uncommon for it to just not really be brought up in the home. Mm -hmm. Which then, if you think about it, where does that, where did that leave you by the time you got to college? I mean, in terms of feeling like you really had uh, a grasp on what it means to be male and what it means to be a a Christian man and, and, you know, basically be a good steward of your sexuality. I mean, where did that leave you by the time you got to college when you're talking about your friends, porn and public sex education being essentially your teachers of what it means for you to be a man? Yeah, for me, it was, um, you know, that wasn't my, I, I did get teaching about being a man. I got that from my dad. I got that from my church. Mm -hmm. Um, and so for me, what it do, did was it really fed this feeling that I had to hide the the secret parts of me. 
when I when I went to college, I ended up living in a house with it was a Christian guy's house, and there was fifty Christian guys there. And so even there, I knew like this is something I have to hide. It's not an open thing we talk about. Um, and so then what for me that led to a lot of shame because I knew like what I wanted to be. You know, I wanted to date the good Christian girls. I wanted to be a good Christian father, husband someday. Um, you know, it was never my desire to just move to Vegas and, you know, (laughs) it was. And so, but what I realized was my internal life just was so far. It was just so completely different from my external life. And that led to a lot of shame, a lot of, um, just feeling like I was letting God down. I was letting everybody else down. Uh, you know, I had to, I had to somehow figure out how to overcome this so that I could finally be a good Christian, you know, and it was, it was this very, uh, kind of shame based legalistic approach to, to, uh, my religion, my relationship with God, you know, and it, uh, at at one point I, like I was even, uh, once I graduated from college, I, I was still struggling with this and figure, well, you know, I've tried everything else and it's not working. So what if I go to seminary? Maybe there I'll get the answers, you know, and it's, um, it, none of it was driven from this, you know, I want to, I, I want to serve God. I want to have a relationship with God. This is what God's calling me to do. When I look back at now, I could see that all of that was driven from this. Like I'm letting God down so mm-hmm. terribly that I need to earn back his favor. And this is the best that I know how to do it. Yeah. You know, and it's, it, it's just, it's amazing how damaging that, that lie can be. And it seems like when we go down that particular trail, um, we're we're constantly searching for like the right information formula. Mm-hmm. Like you know, you mentioned seminary, and oh my goodness, there's so many people that go into seminary with that same kind of mindset as like a like I'll find the answers here, right. um, and and it's kind of like we just keep chasing that information formula trail, and oh, if I could just get the right pieces of information in the right order, then somehow it's going to completely heal this relational defect that I have. And it's like, listen, information in and of itself will not actually does not actually transform what is fundamentally a relation relational problem, and yet so many people. Uh, Christian, well-meaning Christians, even well-meaning pastors will direct people in that in that way and say, well, you know, listen, you just need to pray more, read your Bible more. And in essence, here's the formula. This is exactly mm-hmm. what you need to do. And then the output will be, you know, shiny, halo, Christian guy, you know. Um, so tell me more about, so you get through college, it seems like things haven't really gotten any better. You've just kind of gotten a greater divide between this public persona and this private self. Um, and so then you go to seminary. So what happens, what happens in seminary? Um, well, actually let's back up just a little bit. The, uh, my senior year of college, I ended up meeting the woman that would eventually become my wife. Um, and she was this just super innocent, um, amazing, godly woman. I was, I was her first boyfriend ever, you know, okay. and like, uh, sometimes I wonder if she even knew pornography existed. And so it, uh, it was very easy for me to hide it from her. Cause I don't think she even realized it was something that, um, was worth considering if it was part of my life. Mm-hmm. And so I kind of decided from day one, like, you know, I'm going to keep this part of my life hidden from her because, eventually, you know, I'm, I'm sure if I try hard, hard enough, I'll get over it and then it'll be a non-issue. And so why rock the boat sort of thing? Um, so that started, started a pattern in our relationship of, of me hiding from her as well. And so I always kind of pretended to be way more put together around her than I was. Mm-hmm. And, uh, in a lot of ways it was, it was me trying to be the guy that I thought she deserved, even though I knew that wasn't me. And so since I couldn't be that guy, I'd at least lie and pretend like I was. And so did so you ever started... feel like I was going to ask right about that because it made me think of something that that really takes me back into my own story and my own history. Did you ever feel like you were sort of um whether you're doing this consciously or subconsciously, did you ever feel almost like you were buying into a kind of fake it till you make it sort of mentality thinking that you know what if I just can get, you know, if I can project who I really want to be, then somehow I will become that person. 
Uh, absolutely. Or, I think I think that was a big part of it. And then also, um, I believe the other lie that pornography is about you know uh, sexual desire, and mm-hmm. therefore once I get married and we can have sex all the time, that then my pornography addiction will go away. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure you've been working with guys and uh, your own experience has probably taught you that that's, that's never the case. Oh yeah, you know? absolutely. And, uh, um, you know, actually more often than not, I see, and this was my experience that my addiction got worse once we got married mm-hmm. and cause you just have to hide it so much deeper and the shame just gets so much more intense. And so, yeah, it was, I really did feel like, um, you know, eventually I would either get over it or we would get married. And either way at that point it would become, it wouldn't be an issue. And so that, you know, I wouldn't say that fed my desire to hide, but that was, um, how I justified it. That's what, uh, that's what I kept telling myself that like, this is why I don't need to tell her. And, uh, you know, in retrospect, I, I really, I really do wonder how things would have been different if I had told her. Cause I remember, um, shortly before we got engaged, we were just going for a, a drive one day and she just asked me, she said, you know, I need to, you know, we've been talking about marriage and all that. And she said, you know, I need to know er- everything about your past. Like, wh- what are you like? What don't I know? And she, she knew that I had been with other, other girls. Um, and she said, you know, I'm not going to leave you. I just need to know that the truth, you know, she basically gave me an out. She said, be honest with me and I'll stick around. What and, was your, what was your heart rate at that point when she, when she asked you that question? Uh, I was really glad that we were in a car staring forward. Yeah. If I, <laughs> yeah. If we were across the table from each other, I don't know, man, but, um, you know, I, that's one of the biggest regrets of my life that, you know, in that moment I could have been honest with it. And I think things would have been completely different. And truthfully, I think that would have, I think my uh, recovery would have started in that moment because mm. she would have walked with me through getting help and all of that. But I chose to hide and I lied to her again. And, uh, you know, and that kind of, that kind of set that course for our whole marriage that at that point I was like, well, now I have to hide it because mm-hmm. I told her specifically, I don't have it. And that's the oh. hard thing, I think, about the the continued uh, spiral into deception um, is the idea that with every lie you tell, it feels like you have to tell another one. It's not like you have an option. There's a certain point, I think, where you kind of turn a corner in in the progression of telling lies where you just you feel like you're out of options. I remember it, for me, it felt very much like, you know, um, I'm basically building a brick wall around me from the inside. Mm -hmm. And so there's a certain point at which you kind of can't get out of this thing anymore. You just have to keep putting bricks uh, around your life. And and so I don't know if that's kind of what you were feeling like, is that there's just a certain point at which you you can't not tell a lie because of how many you've told before. You feel forced to continue to lie because you're so afraid of what would happen if anybody got behind that wall. Right. And, and a lot of it for me as well was I knew that the truth was going to be painful for her because I knew that a lot of the, the true things that I had not told her were, were sins that I'd committed against her were things that were going to break her heart. And so for me, I would, again, I would justify that, you know, I don't want to tell her because it would hurt her. But in reality, what I, what I hadn't realized was that I had already hurt her. I just, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't willing to face the consequences of it. So I was yeah. continuing to hurt her more to protect myself from having to face the damage of what I had already done to her. And so, yeah, it just, it continued to build that wall, as you say, and it just got, it got higher and higher. And the way this, I mean, the, the problem with, with all this is once we got married, um, you know, I realized pretty quickly my pornography addiction wasn't going away. I realized that it was actually getting worse and, and cause what happened is, uh, you know, my wife never knew the real me, our, our whole marriage. The only version of me that she knew was this, this fake version that I would let her see this, uh, you know, this pretend version of me without my porn addiction or without any issues. Mm-hmm. And so what happened is every time she tried to love me, every time she tried to ap- approach me, uh, intimately or any of that subconsciously, I would realize she's not actually desiring the real me. She's desiring this fake me that doesn't exist. And so no matter how hard she tried to love me, 
I never allowed myself to receive it because I knew it wasn't coming to the real me. And so over time, we never, we never developed a, a closeness between us. We became pretty quickly, we just became roommates. And, mm-hmm. and I would find I had so much shame associated to sexuality because of my addiction and because of all the, the ways that I knew I was hurting my wife in that area that then she would, I would never instigate. And whenever she would, I would find excuses to pull away. And so here I have this, this beautiful, attractive, loving wife that's trying to pursue me. And we'd go for months and months at a time because I would, because of my shame, I would constantly be pulling away from her. And of course that just destroyed her. Well then, yeah, because you're the only one that knows what's on the other side of that wall. So she's left to try to figure out what is wrong here and so right. many wives in that situation, they turn inward and start looking at, well, where, what flaws am I bringing here? What what dysfunction am I bringing? And they start kind of imploding on themselves. I'm not sure if that's what happened with your wife, but uh, I just see that happen so often where they just kind of start withering because they think it must be me because all I see when I look at him is an apparently functional person who doesn't want me. And so right. how can they not personalize that, you know? Yeah. And, and she'd ask me specifically, like, what's going on? And I would say, you know, I knew, but I didn't, I wasn't going to admit it. So mm-hmm. I would just say, I, I don't know. And so then you're right. She had, she had no other option, but to assume there was something wrong with her. And I remember just sitting there watching herself cry herself to sleep, you know, multiple times and just thinking what's wrong with me. Why, why am I still doing this? You know, but I, yet I didn't have the courage to come clean and face the reality yet. I still was holding on to that belief that someday I can overcome this and then it'll all be better. So what did it take for you to get to a breaking point then where you actually started dealing honestly with what was in the dark? Um, for me, it was, it was a multi-step process, but, Uh, you know, I like to think that 90% of my freedom came in one afternoon and that was, uh, my wife was out of town. We'd been married about six or seven years at this point. I think it was about six. Um, we were not close. You know, she was, she was very, uh, hurt all the time just because of our lack of closeness. And so she was gone that weekend. And I remember at that point I was just desperate and I, I'd worked for a publishing company, uh, designing books. And one of the books that came across my desk was called the bondage breaker by Neil mm-hmm. Anderson. Yeah. And, uh, the book was, talks a lot about spiritual warfare and our identity in Christ. And, you know, I grew up in a very conservative church and I don't remember ever really hearing much about spiritual warfare. So I'm, as I'm designing the book, I'm catching little glimpses here and there about, you know, spiritual bondage. And I was very skeptical. I, to me, it's like, okay, that sounds like a, you know, Halloween movie type thing. But in the back of the book, there's these, uh, these prayers of repentance. And I figured, well, nothing else is working. I'll give it a shot. So I sat down and, and the way it works is basically you systematically start writing down all the areas in your life where you have acted out sexually or whatever. You just ask the Lord to bring all those to your mind and then you pray through them one at a time and hand them over to God so that he can break that bondage. And I realize now looking back that that was the first time that I actually asked God to help me with my addiction. Other than, Every other time I'd say like, God, take this away from me. But it was it was me. Really, my heart was saying, Lord, show me what I can do to overcome this. This was the first time when I said, God, I can't overcome this. I need your help. This is a bigger problem than I can handle. And it took me about four hours to go through those prayers. And I remember when I was done, I just felt this sense of peace, but I didn't really think much of it. Uh, But I started to realize as the days went by, like my typical pattern had always been like I would wake up before my wife and I would go straight to the computer every morning. And I realized after about a week or so that uh, I hadn't done that at all. I hadn't even desired to do it. And that was really kind of the first glimmer of hope that I got. And, uh, you know, I say that was about 90% of, of my recovery because it, even though the, the desire for pornography was gone, there was still a lot of relational and emotional healing that had to be done. And I feel like God really set me free from the desire to look at porn so that I can get my head above water long enough to actually take an honest look at the rest of my life. Mm. And, uh, 
so in the weeks that went by, you know, at that point, I, a part of me was really relieved because I was thinking, oh, cool, like this is gone. Now I don't ever have to tell my wife. Right. And uh, which, of course, God knew better. And it's uh, to this day, I can't explain it other than than God intervening. But, you know, I had been diligent about covering up my uh, Internet history. And, you know, that was just part of my pattern. And one day, just uh, as far as I know, my wife had never bothered to check before. But one day she just had this desire, like, oh, I'll go check the Internet history. And she had to go back like over a month at that point, And she found some stuff that I know I had deleted. And yet it was there. And so it had to have been divine intervention. Mm -hmm. But as as hard as that was at the time, I could see that how important that was in my recovery, because that was you know, she, she asked me about it. And, and I think if I had, if I had not already experienced a level of freedom, um, I would have, I would have tried to make excuses and hide, but because I had been walking in freedom for a few weeks now, I, uh, you know, I, I came clean and I said, yeah, I, I had this addiction and, you know, but now I'm healed. It's okay. Like right, thinking yeah. that she was going to be like, you know, yay, let's celebrate. Um, but it was it was very much the opposite. It was a it was a bomb going off in in, in her heart, and so that really started a. Uh, it was about a year and a half journey of us trying to uh, trying to repair that, trying to figure out how to have a marriage. Now that she had just suddenly realized this guy she thought she was married to didn't actually exist, mm. she's trying to figure out who this guy is that she's married to. Um wondering whether or not she'll ever be able to trust me. And, uh, and how long had y'all been married at that point? We'd been married about, uh, I think it was about six years at that point. And, you know, she just realized in that moment, our whole marriage had been a lie. And over the day, she started to kind of put the puzzle pieces together and started to realize like, wow, all these issues in the bedroom, all these issues with us not connecting, you knew the answer all along. And yet you, you chose to sit there and watch me suffer rather than be honest. Like what, what kind of person are you? Yeah. You know, and I remember having those just really painful conversations and, but the worst part, um, you know, and we may want to save this for, for part two, cause this is a whole nother story. But, um, you know, the worst part is I still hadn't been completely honest with her. Mm. You know, I told her, I confessed to what I had been caught in, which was the pornography, but my addiction had, had broken out of the computer. I'd had affairs as well. And I was still not willing to tell her that. And so through all of our counseling, through all of our attempts at reconciling, I was still lying. I was still saying, I've told you everything. You should trust me. But in reality, I was still holding back the worst. And, and you uh, know what? I think I think we see that a lot in guys who do what I call sort of progressive confession. <laughs> you know, it's like even though you need to ultimately, you know, get totally honest about what's been going on, it's just so hard to bring all of it into the light. There's just such a grip of fear and shame that it just paralyzes guys. And and Stephen, we are gonna we are gonna pause right there. Uh, but before we're we got about a minute left, and I just wanted to at least uh, let you know let our let you tell our listeners about your book, and then how they can also connect with your ministry. Yeah, so um, beltoftruth.com, that's my blog, my ministry website. Uh, that's kind of the central hub of all the stuff I'm doing online. You can you can contact me there. You can find out about my book, 10 Lies Men Believe About Porn. I've got links to all the different online retailers. Um, and actually, if you, uh, if you go there now, I'm not sure when this is going to go live, but uh, I do have, I had somebody donate enough for me to give away 250 copies of my book. So if you, um, there's a post, I'll make sure it's at the top of, of my, uh, of my blog, but there's a coupon code in there that if you use that, you can get my book for, for, uh, yeah, I mean, you still got to pay shipping, but it's like two fifty. So basically, I mean, you can get a copy of my book for free, but that's only, I, we've only got about 50 left at, with that code. So awesome. you'll want to jump on it. Well, Stephen, thanks again for being with us. And uh, listeners, I hope you come back next week because we are going to have Stephen back for another session just to kind of hear what he's learned in recovery and also just kind of what he's been doing in ministry. So listeners, we'll see you back here again next week on the Pure Sex Radio broadcast. Pure Sex Radio is paid for by Be Broken Ministries. 
visit us online at puresexradio.com. 